Good evening. It is a good evening. Tonight we will go where, see, together, we will go where no man has gone before. Have you ever heard that one before? Well, I ran out of meetings. You got seven myths. How many more could there be? So I told you I cheated on this one. We're bundling a few together tonight. So we're going to hit a few different topics, myths about the last days in general. But um, I've had a number of people ask, you're, you're going through so many verses. Do you have like a list of the verses? Not yet, but it'll be all in the free offer in the book, deadlymythsbook.com. Put your email address in. As soon as we've got that, not only all the verses, but all the commentary, everything in my notes, everything is going to go into that book. And we're going to adapt all of this 10-part seminar into a 10-chapter book. And we'll add a lot more too that, oh yeah, we should have said that. We should have gone there. Um, also, when, when we were studying last night on the mark of the beast, it probably begs some questions in terms of like what are the political powers of the last days that are going to be enforcing the beast's mark? And how do we understand the true church, the truth of God, and who are the people of God in the last days? That's all going to be in this upcoming shorter series, America's 11th Hour. 400 years of providence and prophecy. You know, we're at the 400th anniversary of the pilgrims, which is pretty awesome, right? So uh, I think that's something to celebrate. What are the principles of the founding of this country in terms of religious freedom, and how are those under attack in the last days? So again, providenceandprophecy.com. Just do the same thing. Put your email address in there, and you'll be in touch with us so that we can go forward and let you know when that that it's really a sequel to what we're doing here, and I don't know where it will be presented and where it will be recorded and stuff, but you'll be in touch with us just by putting your email address in. So neither of those two things is, uh, is coming out quite yet, but later this year, Lord willing. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a glimpse into that last day final stuff, just a few slides that we didn't get to last night in terms of the, the beast's mark, and you might say, well, really, is this, is this possible? There's going to come laws enforcing the observance of the counterfeit Sabbath. There will be laws about not buying or selling unless you acknowledge at least in deed, but maybe in true convictions that the beast's counterfeit is the truth. Well, that sounds out outlandish. I know that sounds impossible, but how about just a couple of years ago, did it sound impossible that you would have in the year 2020 lockdowns across the world, that half of the world would be under a form of house arrest in a way, the greatest violations of, 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 of civil liberties in the history of America, other than slavery, of course. But um, you say, okay, you didn't think that they would be able to get away with that kind of thing, deeming uh, businesses as non-essential and all sorts of things. So you might say, well, there's reasons for that and people meant well and keeping people safe, but it sets the precedent for the empowering of the totalitarian state to proclaim edicts in the last days that will restrict religious freedom. And the Pope himself has actually spoken about this. This was the two popes ago, Pope John Paul II. Christians will naturally strive to ensure civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. Respects their duty is a nice way of saying enforcement. Laws requiring that observance as it was in the Dark Ages where mandated by the church and state merged as one to enforce papal law across the board. There will be a return of that religious intolerance, a return of that authoritarian type of thing, not respecting human freedom and individual conscience. There was a state senator in Arizona who spoke the truth in the first half of this quotation. She was speaking of the horrible erosion of the soul of America. Amen. We are seeing some nastiness happening, destruction of the soul of America. And she says we are slowly eroding religion at every opportunity we have. Yes, secularism is not the answer to religious totalitarian intolerance. Here's her answer, though. Probably we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday to see if we can get back to having a moral rebirth. I want a moral rebirth. We need revival and reformation as individuals, nationally, societally, in our churches. We need that revival. We need that reformation. A moral rebirth is absolutely needed. Do you do that through the force of law? Do you use the coercive arm of the state to mandate that people observe the first day of the week. This is uh, problematic to say the least, to say we're going to be forcing people to, people to honor the 
papacy's mark of authority. There was one more that was in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette of December 25, 2015. It says, our Congress should revisit and our candidates for president should consider advocating the restoration of Sunday as a day of rest, a paid day of rest, a required day of rest. Now we have the distraction of unnecessary shopping. That's true. In the not too distant past, non-essential business establishments, this was 2015, non-essential business establishments were required to be closed on, on Sundays. Americans deserve a day of rest and today would be with their families. And so this is couched in a lot of good stuff there, isn't it? When I was a kid, most of the businesses were closed on Sunday in my area. And I mentioned how our family had that special family day. And these are true and good values. But when you do it through the force of law and you do it contrary to God's law and go with the Pope's counterfeit day, we start to have some problems here, don't we? But is it surprising? Maybe you didn't know these things were in the editorials in the statements from state senators, and of course the Pope himself calling for these things. So it's gonna be building, prophecy says it'll happen, and I know it sounds like hard to believe because we can't see it with our eyes, but yet again, the last couple of years have sounded pretty hard to believe and we're in the midst of it. And it would have sounded outlandish and crazy just a little bit ago to say human beings will be deemed non-essential in most of their life and livelihood and business activity and commerce and buying and selling would be restricted because of COVID-19. So here we are now in session nine. That was just a follow-up from session eight. <laughs> Myths about the last days. We're going to try to touch on the rapture, on Israel and on the judgment. When is the judgment and is this significant in our day or is this just something that happens after the second coming of Christ, the judgment? Well, let's begin with the really heartwarming words of Jesus Christ. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is the great hope, the blessed hope of the Christian, isn't it? Did you know that one out of every 25 verses in the New Testament relates to Jesus' second coming? All the way back to Enoch. Enoch was prophesying about the coming of Christ. The Protestant reformers, this was a central truth in the history of Christianity all the way down to our day. The Bible refers to it as the blessed hope in Titus 2, verse 13, the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there will come a time where all the sorrow and all the pain and suffering and evil will be wiped away. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Oh, I can't wait for that to be proclaimed. That's in the last couple of chapters of the Bible right there, saying this is the final state of things, the new Jerusalem, great song. We have this hope and this bright future. It's a land that is fairer than day, stretching out for eternity in front of us. Soon we will be caught up together with the dead in Christ who rise first and be carried away. Do you know what the word carried away can also be called? A rapture. Literally, to be carried away. That word is a good word to use to describe being carried up into the sky to meet the Lord when he returns. And we can take a lesson from how, for, from how things went at Jesus' first coming and apply that lesson, several lessons actually, to the second coming. For example, who was really prepared for the Messiah to come in Bethlehem as a baby and live a, 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 a poor a life of poverty and suffering and persecution and die a, the, the, servant's, the suffering servant's death of Isaiah 53. Very few people were really anticipating that Messiah, weren't they? The nature of his first coming was misunderstood because the prophecies were misread and human pride or our own ideas, the value, own ideas of the Pharisees were displacing the word of God. Do you think maybe something could happen in the last days? The nature of Christ's second coming. What is this rapture event when we are caught up together to be with the Lord in the air? Um, usually, as we've said before, the crowd is not on the right path. Usually, the, broad, the, the way to destruction is broad. The way to life is narrow. Uh, how about when in Noah's day? Jesus said, as it was in Noah's day, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. How many people were saved on the ark at the time of the flood? 
only eight in the entire world. Almost everybody else was destroyed. And you might say, how can that be? The, the prophecy was so clear, so simple. Get on the boat because a flood is coming and boats float. Get on the boat. It's very simple. But human pride rises up and doesn't trust the things that sound impossible. No way, they said. It has never rained. I mean, the, or the, water, the plants were watered from a mist that came up. As you read in Genesis, <clears throat> well, it'll be the same thing in the end, not eight, and not to get technical about the number, but the smaller sector, the road to life being narrow, some will be saved, indeed, and anybody can, who comes to Jesus in faith, because salvation is through his grace alone, but we have to be in the word of God, because Jesus said, these are the scriptures which testify of me, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Did you know the average American family has several copies, four copies of the Bible in their home, but only one in ten, less than one in ten, born-again Christian families is reading the Bible together ever once during a given week. So we have the word of God. We have the clear prophecies of Jesus' second coming. There's no reason any of us needs to be deceived. <clears throat> the Bible tells us a lot about this last event, the coming of Christ, this blessed hope. I'd like to study it together with you so we can be very clear on what it's like and what it's about. Let's start in Acts 1, and we're going to read verses 9 through 11. This is when Jesus ascends into heaven, and a couple of angels appear and talk to the disciples, the apostles who had witnessed Jesus' ascension, and they explain something about the second coming after Jesus ascends into heaven following his resurrection. In verse 9, we read, And when he had spoken these things, Jesus spoke these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, Shall, come, so, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. In like manner. Underline those words. His coming will be in like manner as, you, as he went into heaven. Now, did Jesus literally, bodily, go up into the sky? They saw it. He did. So the first coming, the, the ascension was literal. The second coming will be literal. Not some spiritual, mythical thing of, you know, Christ's second coming happened and now we all have the kingdom of God and we are perfect in our uh, sanctified bodies. And there's a lot of fanaticism that emerges when people talk about not real second comings of Jesus. He says, many will come in my name. People will say, there he is. He's out there. He's in the inner rooms. He says, don't believe it because reread in this text his second coming is going to be visible. Count how many times you see words involving sight, involving seeing, involving beholding. I'm giving you some of them away there, but see how many you count. And I'm reading the same text again, Acts 1, verses 9 through 11. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, the two men in white apparel, and they say, Men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Did you get five? I got five there. You had beheld, sight, looked, gazing, seen. Did they see Jesus? Was he visible when he was going up? He will so come in like manner. Do you think his second coming will be visible? <laughs> There's no doubting it. It's emphasized multiplicity there. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will... Do you know what the next word is? See him. So there's no doubting this. Jesus amplified it even stronger. He said, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And in verse 27, he says, It's going to be like the lightning that shines from the east even unto the west. Everybody's going to see this event. It will be not just literal, but also visible. Now, here's another one from 1 Thessalonians. It's going to be audible. Listen to this. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The second coming will be, indeed, it will be audible. So there's the three, literal, visible, 
audible. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. It's not going to be silent. It's not going to be secret. It's going to be a fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. We studied that a few nights ago. It's going to be a glorious event, my friends, and I cannot wait for that great day. You're not going to miss it, by the way. Everybody's going to know it's happening when it's happening because it's going to be a multi-sensory, visual, auditory, glorious, literal event. And the dead in Christ will be rising first. It's going to be the most magnificent event in the history of this earth, the least secret event in history. So... You've heard this idea that it's like a secret rapture and then life continues on after Jesus comes again. I implore you to read the Bible for yourself. I hope you never take the word just of a speaker and what he says. Only, hopefully, the word of God has spoken during this series. Because you read that cover to cover and you can't find a single mention of a secret second coming of Jesus. So... I, I can't give you a Bible study on all of the texts exhaustively that teach the secret second coming of Jesus. I guess the blank slide up there right now would be the exhaustive study because that's all of the texts. It would be zero. Um, that would be how many you will find. Uh, study it for yourself again, but it's in the fiction books and it's in the exciting you know, Christian movies about the rapture and the seven-year tribulation and we're going to talk about that too. There was a movie called A Thief in the Night. Do you remember that one from decades ago? A Thief in the Night. And the idea was since a thief kind of sneaks in, into the house, like Jesus' second coming will also be a secret event because it's described as a thief in the night. Well, let's look at the text in 2 Peter where, it's, where that phrase is used and we'll see what, what he means by that phrase. It says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So whatever thief in the night means, it doesn't mean a secret event. It means, in this text, he's coming as a thief and at that time, the earth is going to be burning up because it's a tempestuous, glorious event. Now, Jesus does tell us what it means by thief in the knife, night then, because you're like, okay, it doesn't mean that it's secret. It doesn't mean that it's quiet. It doesn't mean that nobody notices, like a thief that sneaks in and gets out with nobody noticing. What did Jesus mean when he said thief in the night? He says, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Oh, three times. Great emphasis there. Very clear. Thief in the night means we don't know when the, the second coming of Christ is. We've been looking at some pretty cool prophecies with time prophecies. We've got another time prophecy coming later tonight. I love time prophecies, but there's no time prophecy indicating the hour of Jesus coming. So he's a thief in the night in that respect. The timing, not the nature of the coming being secret. There's not such a thing there. It only is left in the... Um, in the fiction books, but have you heard of being left behind for another seven years? Is that in the Bible? Well, read, read the Bible cover to cover. I, you know, I'd heard these things, and I had not studied the Bible for myself, and I was kind of on the fence, like, what does the Bible teach? Having studied the Bible, I go, where did we get this from? Well, we got it from the prophecy teachers, and well, we can't go to man for our understandings of things, because that's going to lead to dangerous and deadly myths and deceptions. It's the seven-year tribulation after the second coming of Jesus is just something not in the Bible. Here's the one text that is misused to, to try to uh, um, argue the point of, of a, a, a life on earth after the second coming. It's in Matthew 24. It says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Now, that's the extent of it. Does the text say anything about life continuing on after the second coming of Jesus? Is there, does, is there a mention of a seven-year tribulation that follows that? It's just not there. It's, what does it say? It simply says when Jesus comes, there will be two groups. Jesus said it as it was in the days of Noah's day, as it was in the days of Noah. Two groups. One group got on the ark and was saved. 
The other group did not prepare and was lost. There's two groups, the saved and the lost. Question, what happened to the lost in Noah's day? Two people were at the hand mill in Noah's day. One is saved, the other is lost. Lost means perish. Lost doesn't mean seven more years and you get a second chance. Two will be in the field, one will be saved, one will be destroyed by the fire, this time not by the water. Two people, same place, same opportunities, same privileges to hear this truth. One saved, the other lost, just like in Noah's day. In Noah's day, did the lost get another chance? They did not. It's a serious warning because when Jesus returns, that's it. That's the end of choice-making, decision-making, probationary time. This is our time right now. That's why the urgency of these messages, by the way, because time is short. Time is running out. Now, you might say, Scott, what about the seven-year tribulation then that the fiction books talk about? Is that seven-year tribulation before Christ's coming? That, again, read this cover to cover. I haven't found a seven-year tribulation in there. There's a tribulation indeed in the last days, a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation, but it's not mentioned as a seven-year tribulation. And when we face tribulation and trouble, when there was 1,260 years of persecution and tribulation for God's people during the dark ages, and in the last days, the time of trouble, God says, I will be with you in trouble. Do you know that scripture in Psalm 91, 15? I will deliver you. I will be with you in trouble. That's how he delivers us. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we walk through it, don't we? But we don't need to fear evil. We hear about tribulation and crazy stuff coming in the last days and persecution, no buy, no sell, death decrees. It's like, ah, people sometimes get anxious. You don't need to. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked into fire. And they, God protected them. And it says that the same will happen with us. We will not love our own lives unto the death. And Jesus will be with us. We follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Now, is there a seven-year period of time spoken of in prophecy? Yes. Yes, we studied it or we started studying it in the first message. This goes way back to last week, a week ago. So how about we review that? Do you remember Daniel 9? There is a seven-year period of time described in Daniel 9. It's in history, not in the future. Let's review Daniel 9. You remember Messiah's 490-year prophecy. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. From the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, which was 457 B.C., the Israelite nation, the Jewish nation, has 490 years to repent. And then that would take you to 34 A.D. Now, 69 weeks into that, or 483 days into that, translated to 483 years into that, it says the anointed one will come. The Messiah will come, and Jesus did come. He was anointed, baptized, anointed by the Holy Spirit exactly in 27 A.D. And then it says in the middle of the last seven days or years of the prophecy, he will be cut off, but not for himself. And sacrifices will cease. That we covered already, and it was powerful to show the validity of the Bible, the certainty of Jesus as the Messiah, and that his sacrifice does satisfy our need for salvation. The lamb sacrifices were no more. The curtain was torn from top to bottom. Sacrifices will cease, it said, at that time. Now remember that this is a 70-year prophecy. I'm sorry, a 70-week prophecy, or 490 days, a day in Bible prophecy corresponding to a literal year takes us to a 490-year prophecy. And we never went all the way to 34 A.D. Uh, last week, Friday, when we studied this, but there's three and a half more years after his crucifixion because you got that last seven years, and in the middle of the seven, at the 3.5-year point, Jesus is crucified. He ascends into heaven a few weeks later, and then you have three and a half more years. Isn't God merciful? Isn't he so gracious to the Jewish nation who had rebelled against him? The Jewish leaders crucified their own Messiah. And he doesn't say, time's up. I've had it with you. He says, you still have three and a half more years. Now, did something happen in 34 AD where they finally sealed their rejection of Jesus? There was indeed a historic event, the taking of the first martyr, the shedding of the blood of the faithful Stephen, who was an evangelist for the truth. And he preached the truth faithfully and was killed by the Jewish leaders. They sealed their rejection of the gospel at that point. So there you have the full 
scope of the, of the chart there, taking you to 34 AD, with the gospel going to the Gentiles after that. And you remember, Jesus had said that you will, go, you will preach to Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. So he was starting with the lost sheep of Israel, he said. That's where our ministry begins. We're going to give them time to finish out this period. And when he came, it says the time is fulfilled. That's what he said um, in his opening sermon. Um, he also tells a parable. Before his crucifixion, he tells a parable about the Jewish nation. And he says, you guys have killed the prophets. And then the, 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 the owner of the vineyard, meaning God sends his son, and then they kill the son. And he proclaims a very, very um, um, meaningful, final word upon the nation of Israel. And it's this. It says, therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. He says, look, you're coming to the end of your probationary period here. And when the son is killed, this is what's going to happen. So he's predicting, he's prophesying that the Jews are not, as a nation, going to repent and come to a knowledge of the gospel. He also says you're going to be ground to powder in that same text there in Matthew 21. Because in Matthew 24, he calls, he says, there's coming not one stone to be left on another, and the, every stone of this temple will be torn down, and the Romans will encompass the city with armies. Within this generation, this will all come to pass, a generation being 40 years. Exactly 40 years later, in 70 AD, you get the fall of Jerusalem. And he predicted that, and he didn't want that to happen. You know, you got to know, God isn't like, I'm giving you this amount of time, and he's like waiting to just torch people and has this vengeful, you know, spirit. He said to Jerusalem at that time, he was weeping, and he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent, her, sent to her. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Remember Ezekiel 33, why will you die, O Israel? His heart is yearning after his enemies who are about to crucify him. He says, I'm your mother hen. I want my children under my wings. You're not willing. And he says, so you're going to be ground to powder. And the, nation, the kingdom of God is going to be taken from you and given to somebody else. So after the stoning of Stephen, it goes global. So Paul can say, it's not about a nation anymore. Most people who believe in Jesus are not of the Jewish race. Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you, Jew and Gentile, are Abraham's seed. That means descendant. And heirs according to the promise. You are an heir. You are a, a, a recipient of the promise of Abraham. You are... Abraham's seed, that would, that would, that's quite a shocker to people when they're like, whoa, really? Father Abraham. I used to sing that song in grade school, in the Christian school I went to, Father Abraham, and you move your arms and you spin around and all that. And it never dawned on me, like, wait a minute, I don't descend from Abraham, but I get to call him Father Abraham. God says, you are Abraham's seed if you are in Christ. That's beautiful. We are all who believe in Jesus, Jew and Gentile. We are all spiritual children of Abraham. And there's much confusion about this in modern Christianity right now. Like, what is Israel? Who is Israel? Where is Israel? What, what, what is the biblical New Testament definition of Israel for us as New Testament Christians, as Bible-believing Christians in the last days? Well, Paul says this, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. So it's not about flesh. It's not about bloodline. It's not about outwardly being a Jew, but it is he who is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. So if I had self amputated, circumcised from my spiritual condition, have I had self removed? Am I converted? Um, then I, the Bible says there, I'm a child of Abraham, a descendant of Abraham, a Jew. You are Abraham's descendants. So he is a Jew who is one inwardly. Now, what about Jews who are ethnic Jews but not converted? Jesus said to the Pharisees, even before this time, this was before the 70 weeks was over, he said to the Pharisees, you are not Abraham's children. That was in John 8, 39. He calls the Pharisees sons of hell. He talks to Nathan, Nathaniel, though. Nathaniel was Jewish, and he said, now here is an Israelite indeed, like a true Israelite, in whom there is no guile. Pharisees, not so much. 
And Paul amplifies this point. Paul was Jewish, but he says, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. So, so not all the ethnic Jews are in God's Israel after that probationary period is over. Not all are Israel which are of Israel. In Romans 11, Paul explains it like an olive tree. And he says, those who were of Jewish bloodlines but are rejecting Jesus Christ are cut off from the olive tree. Now, question, why were most of these, these Jews at the time of Jesus cut off? It, Paul says it very clearly. It's not some anti-Semitic thing. It's not like God all of a sudden doesn't like descendants of Abraham. It's for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So if any of us, Jew or Gentile, tries to acquire our own righteousness and doesn't seek Jesus and his righteousness alone, then you're not going to have righteousness and you're not going to have the nourishment from the olive tree and the spiritual life that flows from it. But speaking of the unbelieving Jews, Paul does say it was their unbelief that they were broken off because of unbelief they were broken off. But how do we stand? Jew and Gentile, we stand by faith, by faith alone. So what makes you stand? Faith, what gets you cut off? Unbelief. It's that simple. It's the Christian gospel for Jew and Gentile alike. Being ethnically Jewish doesn't make you part of the tree. The tree is the Israel of God. The tree is God's people. You partake of the root of the tree, the olive tree, like Abraham's seed and everything that went before. So it says here in Romans 11, also in that same context, this is the good news. It's not condemnation for every individual Jew, whoever lived and whoever will live. It says, and they also, the Jews also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Do you think Paul knows a little something about that? Paul was one of those people, right? Jesus came. He rejected him. He was laying his coat approving of the stoning of Stephen. Right there at the end, he was still against Christ. So you, did his probation close? No. As a nation, the nation of the Jews, their period had closed. But Paul was knocked off his horse and saw the, Jesus, the, the light of Christ and heard the voice of Jesus, and he was converted. So this verse that we just read, if these people who were cut off don't persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in again. Praise God. So does God have one people or two? Does God have one people group that is his kingdom or two separate ones like Gentile believers? and Jew No, it's one tree, one olive tree. As he put it this way, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. One body, one people, one bride, one olive tree, one Christ that all must serve in order to be part of the people of God. Now, what does this have to do with the end time deceptions? Well, have you heard from the prophecy gurus and the fiction books and the movies and stuff, the ideas of like, you know, a modern nation state called Israel that was founded in 1948 is prophetically significant because after the seven years of tribulation, or after the second coming, the secret second coming, there will be the seven years of tribulation and Israel will take center stage, the nation of Israel. Well, what is the biblical definition of Israel? We're, we're seeing it right here. It is the people of God, you and Gentile, who are believers in Jesus Christ. Do you know that the top three prophecy teachers along these lines have sold 70 million copies of their books? This is a hugely uh, persistent issue in the church today. But Israel, biblically speaking, in the New Testament, is not a modern nation state. It is not the country that was founded in 1948. In fact, some would have, have taught that this prophecy right here was fulfilled in 1948, but you'll be able to identify how it was not. This is not uh, being fulfilled by the modern nation state of Israel. See if you can figure it out, how it's not. It says, now it shall come to pass when you, speaking of God's people, the Israelites, when you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice, that the Lord God, your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. What part of that text makes this not a fulfillment? There you go. It's conditional, isn't it? When you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice, then God will gather you again. So what was it that gathered them again? Well, it was, you know, political movements, geopolitical stratagem. I mean, it's just a, a human devising. It just happened. And, you know, the Holocaust had happened. That was tragic. And so you give the Jews their homeland. And did the Bible prophesy that that would take place? It did not. 
And how do we know? Because this prophecy is conditional. It says, you will be gathered together by God when you return to the Lord and obey his voice. And was there revival among the Jewish people in the 1930s and 40s leading up to that? Did they come to Jesus as their savior? No. Um, they did at one point, though. You remember Nehemiah? Remember Ezra? This prophecy was fulfilled, but it was fulfilled in the Old Testament when they were gathered back from Babylon. Praise God for that. So um, we're in myth number six, myths about the last days. Antichrist and his deceptions are not here yet. Oh, they're in the future. You don't need to worry about Antichrist. He will be, we will be raptured before Antichrist appears. He appears during a seven-year tribulation in a literally rebuilt temple in the modern nation-state of Israel after the secret second coming of Jesus. You can see why we had to bundle some myths together on this one, because that's a whole lot of deception there. It, it diverts from Rome to Israel, first of all. It diverts from history in the present to the future. And also this concept of temple. In the New Testament, the temple is history, right? Uh, when Jesus was crucified, the veil was torn in two. No more animal sacrifices, no more test temple. Jesus said it will be torn down 40 years from now. It happened. Physical temples are history for the church of God. But there still is a temple. Do you know there's a temple still? Yeah, you know what I mean. Ephesians 9, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. A cornerstone of what? Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of this whole building fitted together, growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. What is the temple? It is you. It is us. We are stones, living stones, as Peter says in chapter 2, verse 5. Living stones being built together. We are the temple. Know ye not that ye are the temple. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 tells us we are the temple of God. Many texts in the New Testament. So Paul says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, apostasy, and then the man of sin, the Antichrist, comes, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You see why this is important to get this correct? The Antichrist arises from within the church, not in the future in a literally rebuilt temple after a secret, secret second coming of Jesus. The attention is being diverted by these doctrines from the Roman papacy, which is the clear doctrine. All ten of those identifiers lined up and so ultra crystally clear and liberating so that we don't have to have a system of works salvation. It's not a condemnation of, of Catholics. Um, Every human being who has been under a system, uh, the darkness of the Dark Ages doctrine is a victim of that, really, if you think about it. But this, um, this also diverts our attention from, from the heavenly temple. When you're going, rebuilding of an earthly temple is all about an earthly temple. We forget about the temple of God in heaven. Remember this text that we looked at a couple nights ago? In Revelation 11, this one sets up the whole final conflict of the last days. We related this to the issue of the Ten Commandments because he sees the Ark of the Covenant in there. But is there a temple in heaven? There absolutely is. I want you to turn to Daniel 7 because last night we saw this amazing truth in Revelation 14 that the judgment hour, that was 14 verse 7, you can see that one on the screen. The judgment hour, the, the time of the judgment has come. It is announced before Jesus comes. You're going to Daniel 7, right? You realize the judgment happens in heaven. There is a temple of God in heaven, and this judgment begins before Christ's second coming. It says in the book of Acts 17, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. So Paul knew that there was a future judgment coming. John, in chapter 14, verse 7, the angel announces the judgment has come, and that is before the second coming of Christ in verse 14. So sometime after Paul and before the second coming of Christ, a judgment was to begin. Let's see if we can figure out when that is. But first, you have to see this amazing scene in the temple of God. This is incredible. In heaven, in chapter 7, you read a magnificently powerful scene. And this is right after the little horn. Oh, there, that gives us another time window here. Because it's after Paul and before the second coming of Christ. But what was verse 8? That was about the little horn. And when did the little horn end? 1798 was the end of the time of the papacy. Now, what you're about to read here comes next in Daniel's prophecy. 
This is intense. He says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was as white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. This, by the way, is millions of angels coming before this scene. And this scene right here is described with these words at the end of verse 10. The judgment was set and the books were opened. The judgment was set. By the way, verse 14 is where you get the second coming of Christ. So once again, we have the judgment before the second coming of Christ, and it's after 1798, after the little horns time. Daniel calls this judgment in chapter 8, verse 14, he calls it the cleansing of the sanctuary. Let's read that verse. This is going to be our time prophecy so we can identify when this takes place. Verse 14 of Daniel 8, and he said unto me, un, the angel said unto Daniel, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, let's identify this date in history, but first, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. What is the sanctuary? You're familiar with, with the Old Testament sanctuary. And let them make me a sanctuary, God said, that I may dwell among them. This was the tabernacle, later to become Solomon's temple. God said to Moses, according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. Well, the pattern of what? Doesn't that beg the question? God gives Moses these, this blueprint, this pattern of something else. A pattern of what? Well, the Bible indicates there's two sanctuaries. Remember Revelation 11, 19. John saw into heaven in the temple. And in Hebrews 8, verse 2, there's a text to study. It tells that Jesus is the high priest of the true tabernacle that was pitched by God and not by man. Also in Hebrews 8, verse 5, it says that the earthly tabernacle was a shadow of the true tabernacle. Well, this sanctuary on the earth had two rooms, and it's a, it's a mirror image of the heavenly one, of course. It's after the pattern. The first room was called the holy place. This was for the daily services that the priests did. The smaller room on the inner section there was the most holy place, and that was not used daily or weekly. It was used annually. We'll get to that in just a second. But the daily services involved the lamb sacrifice, most prominently for our purposes of understanding Jesus as the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You confess your, head, your sin on the head of the lamb. The blood is spilled, and that death of the lamb reminds you of the truth that Sin kills. In the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. The wages of sin is death. And even more importantly, it shows who died for our sins. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is foreshadowed in that incredible service that they did on a routine basis. The priests would participate in ministering the blood on the horns of the altar, on the curtain in a number of places, and now the sanctuary itself has the record of sins on it. The sinner is forgiven, but there's yet one more service, the annual service. Once a year, the priest would go in, only on the Day of Atonement, into the most holy place. And he would take blood to minister, but not in that holy place. This is the, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the great cleansing of the sanctuary day. Symbolically, the sanctuary itself is now having the, 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 the remembering of sin, the, the memory of sin, the, the, the record of sin removed and is expunged. The sanctuary is, the word is cleansed. We'll come back to that in just a second. You'll see why that's important. Now, this day in the Jewish year had, very, had various names, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the cleansing of the sanctuary, or the Day of Judgment. And this is the day where Jews would greet each other, still often in, in, in Jewish circles. They would say, may you be sealed in the book of life for good. Isn't that interesting language that we study the seal of God? May you be sealed in the book of life. On the day of atonement, they would say that. And Jesus tells Daniel, he says, the Gabriel says to Daniel, that the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And what is, what is this? Is this a prediction of like a resuming of that Old Testament sanctuary? Where, okay, we're going to have just, just the earthly sanctuary be cleansed. 
Well, this is something much, much bigger. As Daniel is alluding to, as Gabriel is alluding to in Daniel 8, verses 15 to 17, he says, let's look at verse 17. Gabriel comes near and says, and, and, and he, when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he says to Daniel, understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. That's a very important verse. Remember verse 14 said, 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Gabriel says to Daniel, this sanctuary cleansing is for the time of the end. And then he says it again in verse 26. The vision of the evening and mornings, that's the, the, the days, the evenings and mornings, the 2,300 days, which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days in the future, the New King James reads. Many days in the future. Now, the, the chapter ends with Daniel confused about this and, and, and overwhelmed by this, and he faints and he is sick in verse 27, and then he does the king's business after that, but he says, none understood it. The last words of Daniel, chapter 8. None understood this 2,300 days vision. Well, you might start by saying, okay, is this 2,300 prophetic days? Yes, it is, because 2,300 Days, literal days, would only be 6.4 years, and that's not many days into the future. So this is a pretty overwhelming prophecy to Daniel. We're talking about 2,300 years into the future from Daniel's day. You remember this slide from previous sessions where we look at a day in prophecy corresponding to a literal year. That's the one that pinpointed exactly when Jesus came and when he was crucified. So when do you begin the 23 years? When do you begin the counting of it? Well, you know they didn't have chapter breaks in the original Bible. Uh, we add that to help us navigate it. That's great. But in the original Greek and Hebrew, they wouldn't have the chapter breaks. You just read right on from the last verse of chapter 8. Daniel's like, nobody understood this 2,300 days. Well, then in chapter 9, Daniel prays. And then God answers his prayer and sends Gabriel to explain the 2300-day prophecy. So let's read about that in verse 21. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. So you're going to now understand that vision that you were confused about. At the beginning of thy supplications, the, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So he's about to explain the 2300 days vision. Do you realize what the next verses are? We studied that the first night. The next verses are the 70-week prophecy. And it begins with 70 weeks are cut off from for thy people. Uh, determined is how some translations render that. But 70 weeks are cut off. 70 weeks cut off from what? Well, from the 2300-day prophecy. So Gabriel said, I've come to explain to you the 2300-day prophecy, and I'm going to give you a 490-year prophecy to give you a glimpse into the probationary period of the Jews and the coming of the Messiah. And then he just leaves the end of that as, oh yeah, eight, four, Daniel 8, 14 says, at the end of the 2300 days, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now I know you're on the edge of your seat as math students wanting to do the math and figure out, okay, what was the starting point of the prophecy in Daniel 9? We remember that was 457 BC. If you missed that, go back and listen to the first session. It's 457 BC, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And then we took 400 90 years brought us to 34 AD. Okay, well, how many years do we have left? What's 2300 minus 490? The, the answer is 1810. So that took us to the year 1844 AD. That's, that's in the past. You realize what we just discovered there. The Bible just told us that in the year 1844, the sanctuary will be cleansed. Well, what sanctuary? Was, the temple, was there a temple on the earth at that time? No, this is the heavenly sanctuary. The, the, the heavenly sanctuary cleansing began in 1844, and this is the last prophetic event in the timeline of Daniel 7 and 8. The, the last thing is the time of trouble, such as no one has ever seen, and the mark of the beast crisis. But we are right now in the end times. The deadly wound was healed. The judgment began in 1844. This is a heavy, solemn thought. Remember, hundreds of millions of angels coming before, and the judgment was set, and the books were opened. We are in that time now. 
And, and what comes in the verses that follow that? The second coming. So that means Jesus is coming soon. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come is the message that is going out literally right now from God's word, preceding and Lord willing, hastening the second coming of Christ. The names in the judgment, every name recorded, every, every human soul is being evaluated, the judgment happening and soon that judgment will finish. And in Dan Daniel chapter 12, it says that the Lord will stand up. The judgment was set. The books were opened. And then in the near future, Daniel stands up in the time of trouble like there never was since there was a nation will begin. Just like the lamb sacrifices pointed to Jesus as the lamb, the high priest's activities point to Jesus as our high priest in heaven. He is cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. This is the real thing. This isn't the shadow. This isn't the once a year day of atonement, which was a really, really big deal to the Jews, by the way. This is an even bigger deal because this is the fulfillment of the antitype, of the tip to type. We are now in the antitype. That was the shadow. We are now in the real thing. Listen to what the Jews would say in reciting their, their liturgies, if you will, about this day. They would say, God, seated on his throne to judge the world, openeth the book of records. This is their Day of Atonement commentary. Jewish encyclopedia still to this day. And the book of records is read. Every man's signature or name being found therein. The angels shudder, saying, this is the day of judgment. On the Day of Atonement, that sanctuary cleansing day, it is sealed. Who shall live and who shall die? Now, you remember Le Leviticus 23 said, On this day, afflict your souls. That means with fasting, with prayer, with heart searching. This is not a time to trivialize our spiritual lives, to play around with the world. This is the time of the heavenly judgment. The sanctuary cleansing has begun. But also the sanctuary symbolizes something. Have you ever read, you are the temple of the living God? So does God want to cleanse us? He wants to forgive us, symbolized by the Lamb. He wants to cleanse us, symbolized by the heavenly sanctuary cleansing that's happening right now. And that's a real thing. And we can say, I can't measure up then. Well, it says Jesus is our great high priest. So we can hold fast to this profession. We don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our infirmities. He was tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. And since he overcame, we can overcome. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of his testimony, we can come boldly to the throne of grace and he will save us to the uttermost. That means heal us. That means restore us. Salvation can be full and complete. How can we overcome? Only by the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 12, verse 11. Pray for that with me right now. Lord Jesus, give us the victory. We give you our hearts and give you our all. May we be overcomers in this last moment. May we be sealed in these last days. In Jesus